UN framework, the Protect, Respect and Remedy framework, which was unanimously welcomed by the UN Human Rights Council in 2008. The threefold framework speaks about the duty of states to protect their citizens and others from violations by corporations of human rights. The respect is a responsibility of all corporations to respect human rights. And then the remedy part is that there are not adequate remedies, not just court remedies, but mediation and other forms of uh, remedies. And having welcomed this framework, the Human Rights Council asked Professor Ruggi to continue working in the same manner to operationalize this framework. And he developed guiding principles in response to that request and to provide concrete guidance and recommendations both to states and to business as well as benchmarks by which their performance can be assessed by other stakeholders. And in October last, the, uh, Professor Ruggi uh, published an outline of the guiding principles. He then had a full range of consultations. Um, I think he has convened 47 consultations in all continents, including a number here on the African continent. And he has made visits to business operations, to their local subsidiaries um, in more than 20 countries. He's conducted pilot projects. He's had a large number of law firms, more than 20 corporate law firms working pro bono for him in his work. So he's been able to marshal a lot of energy for that work. And now um, the guiding principles are being considered by the Human Rights Council, which is expected uh, to endorse them during this week. And the guiding principles highlight what steps states should take to foster business respect for human rights, provide a blueprint for companies to know and show that they respect human rights, and reduce the risk of causing or contributing to human rights harm, and constitute a set of recognized benchmarks for stakeholders to assess business respect for human rights. The principles are organized under that UN framework that I set out, the three pillars, the state duty to protect human rights, the corporate responsibility to respect human rights, and the need for greater access to remedies. I have the guidelines here. They're quite detailed and lengthy, but if in the Q&A afterwards you want to ask any further questions, I'd be delighted um, to elaborate. We're now at the stage where we're going to have this framework and guiding principles at the global level, but we all know that that's a little bit abstract. And that's why a conference like this is so important, because you have to operationalize. You have to say, what does this mean in practice in the work of the governor of the state of Lagos, in the work of corporations um, doing business here in Nigeria and elsewhere in Africa? And clearly, we're still at the early stages of addressing the complex challenges related to private sector roles and responsibilities in ensuring respect for human rights. Much of the work ahead will involve applying internationally agreed principles to difficult local and national realities and the kind of dilemmas I was speaking about earlier. It will require as well overcoming challenges facing specific industry sectors. For example, John Ruggi recognized that the extractive industry sector has the most difficulties and is most likely to be in some way or other violating human rights. And of course you have uh, a very significant extractive industry sector here in Nigeria. Yet we shouldn't underestimate the importance of the place we have reached. For the first time, the UN human rights system has affirmed that all businesses indeed have a responsibility to respect human rights and that all must be able to demonstrate that they are meeting this responsibility. They have um, a due diligence responsibility and they must show that they've taken some positive action irrespective of local contexts and of government uh, capacities. As John Ruggie has made clear, providing greater clarity around the human rights responsibilities of business has the potential to shape the direction of a range of policy and practice domains in the years ahead, from multi-stakeholder initiatives focusing on specific human rights challenges to the emerging field of responsible investing, which was referred to earlier this morning, and from the adoption of individual corporate policies and public reporting mechanisms to the development of industry-wide standards. Unless this work also has the potential 
to influence the future direction of the UN Global Compact, the world's largest voluntary corporate um, uh, citizen initiative, um, a lot of the impact would be lost. So there is a conscious aim of not only growing the membership of the Global Compact in the next few years to 20,000 co corporations by 2020, but also mainstreaming corporate responsibility um, and the guidelines um, put forward by Professor Rug Ruggie. I believe strongly that the quality of engagement that Global Compact participants undertake must be scaled up as well, uh, as well over the coming decade with greater attention given to demonstrating how companies are integrating into their policies and practices the Global Compact's 10 principles in the area of human rights, labor, environmental standards, and transparency. We now have an important opportunity to fully align the UN Global Compact with the Protect, Respect, and Remedy framework and to explore what this will mean in practice. But an equally important challenge is to ensure that governments fulfill their own duties to protect people from rights abuses caused by or involving corporate actors. And the Protect, Respect, Remedy framework rightly stresses the importance of this core obligation of governments, which has in the past not been given proper attention. And that's again why I was very impressed with the speech read out on behalf of the executive governor um, of the state of Lagos because he was clearly factoring in the government responsibility and the role 